Hey everybody, welcome to TREM 3841, Elements of Multimedia Design and Production. My name is John Janone, and I'll be your instructor for this course. I'm very excited. This is one of my favorite courses to teach. It really goes deeply into the stuff that I'm super interested in, and I hope that you'll get a lot out of it. We're going to have synchronous meetings every week according to the course schedule on Wednesdays, 9.30 a.m. to 2 o'clock p.m., and those are typically going to be just like this one, a YouTube instant premieres. And the reason for that, the reason I'm not going to use Zoom um, or something else like that is because I want to sort of prepare a package for you and a series of assignments and something that you can pause and rewind as you need to. There are going to be some things where there's going to be time limited, but generally I want you to be able to take your time with the material, go back to the material, and then I will be very available to you by email and also on our Discord server. Also, I have office hours. There'll be uh, voice chat office hours on the Discord server. Uh, but really, you can contact me and set up a meeting anytime. I, I want to be extremely available to you and give you all the support you need to really to have a great experience in this course. So there's some things I had wanted you to do, hoped you could do before the first class meeting. So if you haven't, you're going to want to do that right now because we're going to be using it later on in the class. So before we get to talking about this course in specific, there's a few sort of general topics that we should address. And one is what's happening with the department itself. Uh, the department has updated its name and mission. So it's now the Department of Television, Radio, and Emerging Media. And the department has committed itself to teaching the concepts, techniques, and technologies rapidly emerging in the 21st century media field. This change will manifest in many classes, including this class, and may not yet be reflected in course catalog descriptions. So the, some of the changes that are happening right now, and they're happening so rapidly, are just mind-boggling. We have artificial intelligence and computer learning uh, becoming extremely influential in the media field. Um, we have incredible visual effects from our science fiction to our natural disasters to our car crashes to our jet planes, the rooms that our characters are in, and even the characters themselves are being generated or simulated on the computer. So whether or not you think this is a good thing or a bad thing, or whether it's going to you know, be harmful to actors or beneficial to actors or is going to have creative potential or not have creative potential, it's coming. Artificial intelligence is coming to our field and it's going to influence the kind of jobs that are out there, the, kind, the way in which productions are made, and it's going to be a significant transformation of the field. Now, I'm not saying we're going to study artificial intelligence in this course in particular. I'm talking more broadly about what we mean when we talk about emerging media and how do you prepare students, how do we as faculty prepare you to be working in a world where the media is changing so rapidly and where it's computers and technology that are doing this changing. How do you become the kind of producers who can walk into an environment where there's going to be new technology on the table for each production you work on? Uh, now, right now, we have virtual sets. We have, uh, we have total virtual environments and... Uh, and, and you know, CGI has progressed to an absolutely astounding level. But, but the thing that's happening that's quite new is the emergence of performers like Michaela. Because Michaela is a completely virtual entity. And she's the first virtual performer to receive a contract with an agent. And this is a really significant moment because she doesn't exist. But at the same time, she appears alongside human performers in music videos. She, she, she has a YouTube channel, quite a popular YouTube channel. And she's entering into the space previously only occupied by real humans. Now, of course, on one hand, this isn't all that different from Who Framed Roger Rabbit. 
mixing animation and live action. But the fact that she is nearly across the uncanny valley, that she's almost convincingly human, makes her quite distinct in the sense that the border is breaking down even more than CGI broke it down between the virtual and the real. And this is going to be an important topic, an important issue in the field very soon. So one of the basic requirements of this course and all production courses in television, radio, and emerging media is computer and internet literacy. Even before the department name and mission change, television radio was the most computer intensive department in the arts at Brooklyn College. If you think about it, all production work, video editing, sound design, radio editing, color correction, visual effects, motion graphics, even screenwriting uses specialized software and requires computer literacy. Now that the department is television, radio, and emerging media, the computational skills required to be successful in the major have increased. So computer literacy is required for this and all television, radio, and emerging media production courses, including but not limited to knowing how to install software on your computer, managing files and folders so that you know where all your files are and they're organized in a comprehensible way, compression and decompression of files and folders so that you can create a zip archive of files, file transfer and cloud services so you can move those files around and share them with other people, Uh, effective use of search engines, almost any question of a general nature that you would like answered about using technology, you can find through some simple internet searches, and I give you some examples of that below. Taking screenshots and making screen recordings, again, you should know how to do this on your computer, on your platform. And if you don't know, it's something you can use search engines to look up. Uh, And then using online tools such as Blackboard, which uh, will be central to this course, Discord, also central to this course, YouTube, where where, where most of the course materials will be posted, Vimeo, SoundCloud, etc. So it's important to note that This course does not teach these basic skills. It requires them as a starting place. So if you do not feel confident in basic computing, this may not be an appropriate course for you. And you may wish to schedule a meeting with an advisor to see if a computationally intensive major, such as television, radio, and emerging media, is right for you. If you have basic competency in these areas but want to improve your skills or fill gaps in your knowledge while taking the course, you may do so. The information is easily available on the internet. These internet searches will produce useful results. Uh, You know, if you don't know how to manage files and folders, you can Google file and folder management in Windows 10 if if Windows 10 is what you're using. Um, Or if you're on a Mac and you don't know how to make a zip archive, you can Google, how do I make a zip archive Mac? Or if you don't know how to join a Discord server, Google, how do I join a Discord server? And, And I've tried all these searches and they produce extremely useful results. So that sort of thing is really a basic starting point for the class. And as I say, if you don't have that fully, you can probably, this, this course could help you get to that level of computer literacy. But if you don't have it at all, you really do need to question whether, you know, such a, such a technologically intensive major as television, radio, and emerging media is how you want to be spending your time. And, and I will, just as a sidebar to that, I, I've had students uh, say to me, well, the reason I'm interested in television, radio, and emerging media is because I want to be an on-screen personality, um, want to be a newscaster or, or, you know, a talk show host. And I say, this is not that major. We do not have a single faculty member that teaches courses in that area or that has that kind of expertise. The theater department does, and theater would be an excellent choice for that. If you want to be an, if you want to be an on-screen person, you know, I would strongly recommend you to 
you know, consider a theater major because uh, even the, the one course that we do offer uh, acting for the camera that has some relevance to that area of interest is cross-listed with the theater department and is taught by a member of the theater faculty. You know, that really is the department that has the faculty and offers the courses that will be most beneficial to you. So this course is going to be conducted in a fully online format with no in-person meetings. Blackboard and YouTube are the primary platforms for course delivery and we'll use Discord for chat. We may use other online platforms as well. Discord is going to be your primary means of communication with me. And uh, I, this is one of the things I like the most about the online and hybrid teaching format is how much uh, we will communicate in the written form. Because I believe that at a fundamental level, all university classes are classes in writing. Every course should be in some way writing intensive. And one of the ways in which this course is, is in the regularity and density of our written communication with each other. But we can talk also because office hours uh, will be held on the Discord voice chat. And in addition to the times listed uh, that are set up as quote unquote office hours, feel free to set up an office hours call for any mutually agreeable time. I'm, I'm, I want to make sure that I'm very available to you. A super essential part of why we go to university is the connections you make with other students. And it gets much harder in an online format to build those connections. You want to walk away from a university course, not only with the experience of having done the course and the knowledge you've gained through the course, you want to walk away with some connections to other people, people whose work inspires you, people whose work ethic uh, is impressive to you, people you seem like you can get along with and potentially uh, you know, work on something together in the future. This is where opportunities come from. This is where a lot of jobs, probably most jobs come from, is someone you know. And university study is a great time to get to know people and not just get to know them, but get to know how they think and how they work. So this is one of, one of the many reasons um, that we have an active discussion forum. Uh, the course has synchronous and asynchronous components. And the synchronous components uh, are not going to be, as I mentioned before, uh, two-way communication synchronous components like Zoom. They're going to be like this, YouTube Instant Premiere videos, um, video tutorials with real-time assistance. So you could be doing a tutorial, but know that I am available on Discord to be helping you uh, if you have a question or get stuck with something. Also homework with real-time assistance. So during the, the synchronous class time, you may be doing homework, but I will be available to you via Discord. Um, and then you'd submit that work via Blackboard. And also we're going to have quizzes, which will be delivered also in the Instant Premiere format collected on Blackboard. And also we may do synchronous readings, meaning I will give a reading assignment and give you a certain amount of time to do the reading, um, or I may record the reading as audio, and then we'll have some sort of activity immediately after the reading that's based on you having just completed it. Um, and, and also when we watch and listen to things, that will be part of the, the synchronous component of the course. But there's also asynchronous components, and these are the assignments that will have a deadline. Uh, these will typically be submitted on Blackboard. Um, so they're going to be tutorials, technical tutorials, that you will do on your own time at your own pace and then submit those on Blackboard. And those will be uh, on the YouTube channel. Uh, they'll certainly be homework that you can do at your own pace and submit on Blackboard. Uh, and of course, there's going to be the course projects. So the pro course projects will be completed on your own time and submitted on Blackboard. And then also, uh, you know, part of the coursework is exploring and getting inspired. You have to go out there and listen to things. Engaging with the course material also means engaging with the world of creative producers who are doing this kind of work. And you know, I'm going to guide you to a lot of that stuff, but also it is part of your work to be looking, be exploring, be finding artists who you think are doing important things and who are inspirational to you. And also uh, finding artists who are new to you and a surprise to you and uh, kind of 
are approaching things in a different way or a way you never thought of. So that's going to be a component of this class as well. So what is this course? What is multimedia production about? That's actually a complicated question. No single semester course can cover the vast discipline of multimedia, nor even a meaningful part of it. So what this course attempts to do instead is provide an approach to multimedia that will impart a broad-based understanding that is applicable across a wide range of multimedia production situations. So I chose an angle on multimedia that, rather than being important in and of itself, teaches you as much as possible about the broader field of multimedia. And that's generative 3D animation in a node-based multimedia environment. I'm trying to hit as many points as possible without having to you know, look at three or four different pieces of software and three or four different workflows. You know, this certainly isn't what you're expecting, may or may not be something that you're interested in, in and of itself, but is a means to get your foot in the door of multimedia as efficiently as possible. One of the reasons we're choosing node-based multimedia is also as an ease of entry while still maintaining as robust as possible a learning situation. So <clears throat> just to talk a little bit more about node-based multimedia. So distinct from code-based multimedia programming and layer timeline-based applications, node-based multimedia environments allow for complex interrelations and interactivity that are difficult to achieve in layer-based multimedia and hard for non-programmers to read and unpack in code-based multimedia. So let me take a little step back and talk about what these different multimedia formats are. So layer timeline based applications are the most common platforms out there. And for instance, this very tutorial is made in Adobe Premiere Pro. And this is a layer timeline based multimedia environment. Now you may say, well, it's not multimedia, it's video editing, but video editing is multimedia. I mean, it has the possibility of image, sound, text, graphics. Uh, it's, a, it's a rich multimedia environment, even though we don't necessarily think of it that way. And part of the reason we don't think of it that way is because it is in a layer timeline paradigm, which really limits its flexibility in terms of doing other things besides editing video. So when I say layer timeline, these are the layers, the stacks. On the top here, we have video one, video two, video three. These are the stacked video layers. And down here, we have audio one, audio two. These are the stacked audio layers. And things that are at the same point happen at the same time. And then the timeline nature is time moves from left to right. So as I hit play on this, Now we owe them a hundred keys of refined coaxium. Right. The playback head is moving from the left to the right. So things on the left are earlier, things on the right are later. And then each layer has multiple controls related to it. So here we see that I've applied a denoise, a dynamics processor, and an automatic click remover to my audio track. So that's the layer timeline based paradigm. We're not using that this semester. So the other thing I'm talking about here is code-based multimedia programming. And uh, just there are many, many examples of that. Uh, one example is the language processing. So you can see here's a simple processing sketch that's following the motion of my mouse. And these two squares are interactively responding to the position of the mouse on the screen. And this is made with these lines of code. These lines of code produce this interactive situation. So this has a much greater potential for flexibility and interactivity than Premiere, but it requires code. And this is one of the things that I really want to avoid in this class, in part because I have taught this class using code in the past and it's not effective for all students. If you don't have any background in coding, if you haven't taken a computer science class or you have didn't do some coding in high school, it's really hard to break into this kind of thinking 
in the course of a single semester while also trying to be creative, while also trying to make stuff that you're interested in. Um, so while code-based multimedia is extremely powerful, flexible, super interesting, and as I say, this, the, the course has been taught with coding in the past, um, both in processing and in a language called Lua, it's not the best approach because it really will alienate some of you and make it much harder for you. Uh, so we're not going to take a code-based approach. In fact, we're going to strictly have a no coding semester. Most environments you can't get very far before some coding is required, but we're going to use one this semester where you can work creatively for years in the environment without needing to write a single line of code. Not, there's nothing wrong with code, and you, and you may very well, particularly if you're in the journalism field, end up doing some coding as part of your work um, because data visualization is an important part of journalism and uh, the language R is uh, a coded multimedia environment for data visualization that really most journalists uh, will need to use at some point. But for now, we get to have a semester of doing multimedia with no code. Um, so we're in a node-based environment. What does that mean? The node-based approach is essentially making a functional flowchart. You draw a picture of what you want the computer to do, and the computer does it. Let me just show you a, a very simple example in Houdini, which is, a, which is one of the most important node-based multimedia environments in the uh, film and television industry right now. It does uh, 3D modeling and animation, visual effects, compositing, simulations, uh, very notably crowd simulations. Very often uh, when you see a crowd scene in a film, only a few of the actors in the crowd are actual human beings and the remainder are a crowd simulation. And Houdini is one of the primary tools for doing simulations like that. So let's just take a look quickly in Houdini. So here I have a box in a 3D world, and here I have the node that creates that box. So if I want to create another object in my world, I can go up to the toolbar, grab it, and I can decide which one I want to render, the box or the torus, or I can drop down a merge node And I can merge the box and the torus and render them both. So these nodes represent what's happening in my world. So I don't have to write any code to create this, nor do I have the necessity of a timeline. I mean, Houdini does have a timeline in it, but one can create outside of time. And that's a very important feature of node-based work. And of course, there's many, many nodes that do an extremely wide variety of things. So I'll just show you one other node, um, the Boolean node. If I take the box and the torus and plug them into the Boolean node, the Boolean node subtracts one shape from the other, or it can add them together, but we already saw how that works in the merge. So. This is, this is the node-based approach, and you can think of it as a flow of information. The, the description of the box is flowing into the left input of the Boolean, the description of the torus is flowing into the right input of the Boolean, and the Boolean's acting on those inputs and doing something to them. And the blue mark here means we're rendering, we're looking at the output of the Boolean operation. So this is node-based multimedia, and it is extremely prevalent. Here's just a few important environments that are node-based. Houdini, which I just pointed out, which is really a, a, a majorly important piece of software in the film and television industry. But then Touch Designer, it's another node-based environment that's, that's related to Houdini in some ways. Touch Designer is for live projections at concerts and, uh, and, and live events. So that's a side of multimedia that deals with real-time interaction. And Touch Designer looks like this. And here's the same setup in Touch Designer that we just saw in Houdini. We have a cube and uh, 
a Taurus, and we feed them both into this Boolean, and the Boolean subtracts one shape from the other. Isadora is also a, a live environment that's used for video projection and interactivity and dance, but it's used a lot in live theater as well now. And Isadora looks like this. It's a, it's a node-based environment where each node performs a function and you connect the nodes together to uh, instruct the computer in how you want those functions to flow one into the one into the other. Fearfowl, or VVVV, um, is another uh, real-time graphical environment that uh, is very popular. And Fearfowl looks like this, where the nodes are connected together. Um, so this Fearfowl patch right here is what's creating this tree fractal. Cables.gl, uh, which is a great uh, tool for creating web-based interactive multimedia, um, is also node-based. So here's how cables.gl works. There's a, there's a main loop, and you can add nodes to it. So for instance, I can add a material to my main loop. I connect them together, and then I can apply uh, that material to, say, a sphere. So I add a sphere, connect it, and then that sphere is now drawn in my window. And so I've just created, and this is inside a web browser. You can see I'm inside the Vivaldi web browser right now. And this is under the hood. This is code-based in that you can look inside each of these nodes and see the code, but you don't have to interact with this code. Um, so this is this is actually a really nice thing about Cables GL is it's both node-based and code-based. Um, this code is actually the code that's inside of the material, the Lambert material that I've applied to this sphere here. And uh, this course could be taught in cables.gl and perhaps another version of it will be, but it's still, cables.gl is still in development. Uh, but like I say, you might want to go to cables.gl and create an account and just play around a little bit in cables because it's super fun and easy. And then the nice thing is the output is web-based. Uh, so Blueprints is a node-based environment uh, for game interactivity in the game engine Unreal. And, and actually, both of the major game engines uh, f f for game development now have node-based game logic systems. Uh, but, but Unreal Engine has had, the, has had the Blueprint system for considerably longer. This is um, an example of the Blueprints node-based game logic system in Unreal Engine, where each of these nodes relates to some event in the game. Grasshopper 3D is for 3D modeling inside the Rhinoceros 3D environment. And this is actually being taught here at Brooklyn College in the art department. Reactor is for creating sound synthesizers and musical instruments in software. And Reactor, again, is an extremely deep language that has many, many layers. So here we're seeing one layer of Reactor that's a fairly high-level layer, meaning we're connecting together larger chunks of nodes to create a functional synthesizer. So here's the control panel of that synthesizer, and then here's the way the elements of the synthesizer are connected together to create the sound. But the interesting thing about Reactor is inside each of these is another set of nodes that creates what it does. And inside each one of those nodes, there are more nodes. And it's nodes all the way down. So unlike cables.gl, where there's code eventually under the hood, in Reactor, it's nodes and then subnodes and then subnodes and then subnodes all the way down to an extremely fine-grained level. Flowstone is an interesting node-based environment because it crosses a, a, a number of different disciplines. It's used for sound synthesis and uh, creating VST plugins for effects and, and music, but also it's used in the sciences and it's used in robotics. And if you take a look at Flowstone, you'll see it's a 
node-based environment where nodes that do things are connected together. So here we see a, a simple synthesizer being built in Flowstone. DaVinci Resolve is mostly a layer timeline-based application. It's a video editing, but it um, it's also a, a very important tool in the film and television industry for grading and color correction. And the portion of it that does the grading and the color correction is node-based. So here is a shot being color corrected in DaVinci Resolve. And these are the nodes that are instructing the software how the path of the image is being processed through multiple color correction and grading nodes. And as one final example, a node-based system called Max. Very, very quick introduction. You hit the end key to create a new node. Any attributes of the node can be typed in after the at sign. And when you hit return, the node is instantiated and whatever that node does will become active. So in this case, I've created a 3D world uh, that has a floating window attached to it and I've turned it on. Then I'm gonna create a video grabber and set it to my webcam which is my V device one. I will turn it on. So I'll create an on off switch and turn it on. Then I'm going to instruct it to send out its imagery every frame. And I'm gonna send that imagery right into my world. And hello, there I am, hi there. So this piece of node based multimedia right here is what's connecting my camera to my screen. So what are we gonna make? Well, that's uh, a great question. So uh, the kind of projects that come out of this class, for the most part, I've found that making music videos, making 3D real-time music videos, covers a lot of the bases that I wanna cover in terms of what I want you to come away from this course knowing. And so that's the starting point. Now, other some students have embarked on different projects. Uh, some students have created interactive projects that are not music videos, but by and large, students come out of this course making generative animated music videos because they're able to demonstrate their knowledge of everything we cover in the course inside that format. So what do I mean by generative animated music video? Well, I'll show you a couple of examples. One great example is Dennis.video. Dennis.video is a code-based multimedia project where the music creates the animation that you're seeing and creates it slightly differently each time, but the animation is actually responding to the sound of the music. So if we look at the About the Video page, we see that Dennis is a real-time video. It's a generative 3D experience whose every moment responds to the song's finest details. Each frame is created in real time. Nothing is pre-rendered. So this is very much along the lines of what we'll be working on this semester. And this video that you're about to see is well within what you could accomplish this semester in this course.
thinking also in terms of work that you could conceivably make using just the tools and techniques that are taught in this class. Let's take a look at a piece by uh, Austrian designer Johannes Lampert, who does the incredible Anatomy of a Track series, where he takes music by composers and bands and visualizes the music.
and this wonderful video by Lemon Jelly, which uh, is probably a little bit outside of the scope of what you could accomplish in one semester in this class. But a lot of what's in here uh, would be very attainable or something something like it uh, you could you could accomplish um, and 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 really just let these things be be inspiration for you and sort of pointing you in the direction the class is going. And this is the last one I'm going to show right now before we get back into the syllabus, but we'll be looking at a lot more work over the course of the semester.
Uh, I really like that piece. So digging back into the syllabus, the next thing I want to discuss is that this is a studio course in the arts within a school of the arts. So that's important to understand that television, radio, and emerging media is an arts program. Students within the program, while you're certainly studying television and radio and emerging media, you're also makers, you're also creators, and you're not just creators of commercial content or professional content, you're creators of personal content. You're creators out of your own personal vision. And part of what you're doing here in this program is developing that personal vision. So the primary goal here is the development of your creative and expressive voice. There, there will be tools and techniques to learn, and, and these will be taught through the online tutorials, but they are not in themselves the focus of the course. The focus of the course is the personal, artistic, creative work you do with these tools. As such, be sure to share time between learning the tools and creating with the tools. Of course, the, with tools you're just beginning to learn, you may not be able to create anything very complex. But still, keep your focus on creating, making something that interests you. And that may be a two-part challenge. You may need to keep the focus on what interests you. And also, if this is not an area that you're automatically or natively interested in, you, you might need to figure out how to cultivate that interest in yourself so that you can see this as a creative, expressive enterprise. And, and, and one word to the journalists, uh, journalists, you are studying journalism, not in a school of journalism. You're studying journalism in a school of the arts. So while, of course, the tools and techniques of your craft are important, you too are functioning within an arts context, and your creative voice and your creative expression is important, even if that's not your professional focus that's the focus of this program to make you creative producers as well as professional producers. So it's essential that you learn effectively from the tutorials. And I have a section on tutorials coming up so that you can quickly move on from the tutorials and begin using your new skills in creative, personal, and even idiosyncratic ways. So if the tutorials are bogging you down, then that's something you want to talk with me about so you can you can learn from the tutorials more quickly and more effectively because the tutorials are not the goal and learning the tools isn't the goal using the tools is the goal so why is it more important to use the tools creatively than to simply learn the techniques that's a valid question there are many reasons and you can see the section below on the liberal arts idea and we'll talk about that as well but i want to highlight one reason here why it's important to use the tools creatively. As you move into the professional world, regardless of what field you end up going into, there will almost certainly be more technically accomplished applicants than you. Being the most technically accomplished candidate is an extremely difficult hill to climb in any field, requiring hundreds of hours of laser sharp focus on a specific tool or technique. The time you have in a single course in a single semester is not nearly enough time to develop technical skill of this level. It is, however, an ideal amount of time to make a creative exploration. And each time you give yourself time and space to engage in a creative exploration, you'll develop your personal vision, style, and aesthetic. The goal of this sort of development is not to have the best or most impressive vision. It is simply to have a distinct one. When you have a reel of creative work that expresses an artistic viewpoint that is clear and individual, you create an opportunity for another person, a producer, a director, project manager, etc., to see something in your vision and to want to speak with you further. This is the advantage that keeping a creative focus gives you. You have a way of distinguishing yourself among a pool of applicants without needing to rise to the top in a competitive struggle, and you will know that you've attracted the attention of an employer or gatekeeper who feels something special about what you in particular have to offer. And I can't emphasize this enough. It's so hard to be the best and the most experienced. You have to have hyper-focus. It's like 
it's like being a classical musician. The hours and hours of daily practice. You need to spend years of disciplined study to become an expert. But to have a distinctive voice and vision, that's something we all can do. That's something we all already have. All we need to do is cultivate it. And then you're not trying to be the best at anything. You're just trying to be a clearer, more articulated version of yourself. And that, you know, seems like a much better goal than to try to claw one's way to the top. Now, of course, you know, one of the great things about university is every course has a different viewpoint. Every professor has a different opinion. And this is just my opinion and I'm voicing it, but it's the opinion I think that's also behind choosing to study the arts and, and, and majoring in an arts program such as this is that you too believe that developing a creative voice, developing your personal voice is actually one of the significant goals of university study. But there are the technical tools to learn. And so it's very important to use the online tutorials effectively. And this is not just about this class. This is a much bigger issue because learning from tutorials is now and has been for several years an essential professional skill with the combination of remote work, online learning, and the proliferation of online tutorials for an incredible variety of tasks and tools, it is likely that you will do the majority of your learning from tutorials as soon as you enter the professional world. Probably all of your learning, almost all professional training is now done through online tutorials. And, and I hear from a lot of students, I'm not good at learning from tutorials. This class gives you a great opportunity to change that. So many students do not have experience learning from tutorials. Very few classes teach learning from tutorials as a skill in itself. This class does, and thus is an excellent way to get this essential experience. For some students, simply developing the skill set of learning quickly and effectively from tutorials could be the most important outcome of this class in terms of what's going to be most useful to you professionally. So. I'll guide you through strategies for effective learning from tutorials throughout the class. And I'll start now with a few basic tips. And, and you're going to be able to apply these today because you're going to be learning from a tutorial in the class today. So it is typically not useful to watch a tutorial. I sadly often see students waste many hours watching and rewatching tutorials. Instead, always do a tutorial, actually following, making, building every step along with the instructor. In the case of my tutorials, which are highly packed by design, this is particularly the case. Never just watch one of my tutorials. Always do it as you watch it. Build it as you watch it. Even if it's a review, build it as you watch it. So tutorials are meant to be constantly paused and rewound. In the beginning, when you're working with a packed tutorial like mine, where the materials is pre presented densely and quickly, you should probably be, be hitting pause five to ten times per minute and rewinding three to five times per minute. So sometimes you're not letting more than five seconds go by in the tutorial without pausing and doing something or pausing and rewinding. That is much, much more than you think it is, unless you are quite skilled already at learning from densely packed tutorials. So when budgeting time for a tutorial, multiply the tutorial length by two as a starting point. So if it's a 30 minute tutorial, budget an hour. After doing a few, you'll get a better sense of your pace and the pace will also vary with the difficulty of the tutorials. There might be some 30 minute tutorials that are gonna take you an hour and a half or two hours. Um, but there's other 30 minute tutorials that you'll blow through in an hour, but you're never gonna go real time through a tutorial if you're doing it properly. So when you're making or building what's being demonstrated in a tutorial, make sure it works at every point. This is key. It's not just about making it. It's about making it and knowing that it works. And that at the end of the tutorial, what you have built works exactly as the demonstrated version does in every detail. And if it doesn't, go back and find the error point because tutorials are not meant to give you general information. They're meant to give you specific information that then you generalize from once you've mastered that specific information. And remember, 
The goal of a tutorial is never to build the demonstrated thing. The goal is to learn the tools, techniques, and concepts behind the techniques. You will likely never build that exact demonstrated thing again. Tutorials are typically arbitrary demonstrations to help you learn the tool or technique itself. Now, this next one is really important. Immediately after completing a tutorial, you need to budget time to work with the tools, techniques, and concepts you were just introduced to. If you have homework, start it immediately after finishing a pass through the tutorial. This is the perfect way to cement the ideas in the tutorial. And particularly in the beginning, you'll need to do more than one pass on each tutorial. So on the first pass, you'll learn about the tools and techniques and be exposed to at least one application of them. In a subsequent pass, attempt to generalize your knowledge. All right, you, 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 you got the specifics from your first pass through the tutorial, but as you do the tutorial again, move from the specific to the general. What are the concepts behind the tools and what are other possible applications for them? Because again, you're not going to use it quite this way again, but you will use it in lots of situations, so understand as much as you can about it. So this is not all there is to learning effectively from tutorials. These are just some of the initial pointers to get you going in the right direction. It's a skill that will take time and dedication and will absolutely be worth the effort professionally. So let's talk a little bit about your interaction with me during the semester. I am constantly available to you via email and I encourage you to be in contact with me regularly. On average, we will probably exchange emails twice per week, and I will require at least one email per week as part of the class participation grade to ensure good communication and to build your skills in framing questions. I'm also available to you via scheduled Discord voice chats, and I look forward to speaking with every one of you this semester. And, 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 and in the beginning part of the semester, please set up some time so we can talk. So asking good questions has always been a key to effective learning. And in an online course, formulating good questions is even more essential. In this course, questions about course material are to be asked by email or on Discord. We're going to reserve voice communication for discussion, discussing strategies or approaches to the material, getting artistic feedback or seeking inspiration, or even if you're just feeling frustrated or not sure what direction to take or want some pointers on how to strategize working effectively from the tutorials. That's great stuff, but if you have technical questions, they're going to be in a written form by email or by Discord text chat. One of the reasons for this is to build skill in formulating good questions. Like learning from tutorials, asking good effective questions is a learnable skill and an essential professional tool. So, this is also going to be an ongoing discussion, but what is a good question? Well, for the purposes of this course, there's four parts to a good question. The question clearly articulates the issue, including any necessary context. It gives a concrete example, whenever possible, that illustrates the issue. It details what approaches have already been tried to address the issue and why it seemed they might address the issue. And this one is really important. Don't ask a question until you've tried to answer it yourself. And when you ask the question, be specific about what you tried, how you tried, because often that information is more important than the question itself in helping me understand what information you need. And give a concrete example of at least one approach you've already tried. So asking a question should never just be an expression of not understanding. Before sending the email, figure out specifically what you do not understand and think about how best to express that clearly and specifically with an example if you can. And then also before sending the email, evaluate your own attempts to address the issue yourself. What steps have you taken on your own specifically? Include these in your email with an example of what you've tried. The answer to a well-formed question will usually not be simple. It will provide information as well as direction to further explore in order to assure or deepen understanding of the issue. So asking a well-formed question is also inviting more work for you. When you formulate your questions, be sure to set aside time to actually explore the answers. So when doing anything besides the most basic work with computers, you eventually run into math. 
Why? Because computers are only capable of one thing, math. Every image we see on a computer display, every sound we hear, every printed page is encoded in the computer as numbers. While very simple software sometimes succeeds in hiding this numeric basis of computing, anyone wishing to move beyond the absolute basics of sound or multimedia will need to confront the wholly numeric basis of the computer as a tool. The good news here is you don't have to do any of the math. The computer is vastly better at math than we are, and since math is its only true language, it doesn't balk at even the most complex calculation. But every time you instruct a computer, you're giving instructions about doing math. And once you begin working beyond the most basic level in sounder multimedia, you'll need to know something about the kind of mathematical instructions you're giving. Again, good news. This is often very simple. Usually, it is as easy as knowing when to have the computer add, subtract, multiply, or divide, and if a series of operations is required, knowing which to do first. In other words, you need to be fluent in elementary school math concepts, the same math you use to understand your finances, do home improvement projects, cook and bake, follow sports, plan travel, etc. Also, it's often about knowing the limits of ranges or relationships of numbers. Here's two simple examples. The instantaneous amplitude of a digital sound, so the volume of that sound at any given moment in time, is represented in the computer by a number between negative one and one. So this is an important piece of information. When you're dealing with the volume of a sound, it's got to be represented by a number between minus one and one. There is no two, there is no minus two. So there's certain math you know you can't do. For instance, you can't add three to the volume of a sound. If you do, you're pushing it out of the legal range. By the same logic, you probably can't multiply it by 100. Unless it's extremely, extremely quiet sound, multiplying it by 100 is gonna push it out of that range of minus one to one. and you'll be using numbers that have no meaning. But for instance, the average amplitude of a digital sound is represented by a number between zero, silence, and one maximum possible volume. So average volume and instantaneous volume have different numeric ranges. This is stuff that you've got to be able to work with and manipulate in this class. This is the kind of math that's required. It's not really math as much as mathematical thinking. Here's another example. Sound is also measured in decibels. So in addition to being measured in this numeric negative one to one range, there's also this measurement called decibels. Every increase of 10 decibels results in a perceptual doubling of loudness. If sound goes up by 10 dB, it will sound twice as loud. So amplifying a sound by 20 dB will result in a sound that is perceptually four times louder, a doubling of a doubling. Ordinarily, we'd say, ah, oh, if, if it doubles when it goes up by 10 dB, if it goes up by another 10 dB, that'll be three times as loud. But actually, that's four times as loud. And if it goes up by 30 dB, that's eight times as loud. There is no math in this course that should even be remotely difficult. The challenge is only in applying the knowledge you already have and could already use effectively in other contexts in a new and different way. And one note to those of you who have some experience in sound, you may have been taught elsewhere that every 6 dB increase doubles the loudness of a sound. This is also true. Every 6 decibels, the sound pressure level of a sound is doubled. This is mathematical doubling that we would use, for instance, if we were looking at protecting listeners from hearing loss, as opposed to perceptual doubling that we would use when thinking about an audience's experience. It is also true that with every three decibel increase, the power of a sound is doubled. This is usually thought of the other way around. You'd say it takes twice as much power to raise the level of a sound by three dB. So whatever power you're using now, double it and that will raise the sound by three decibels. And that's useful when thinking about amplifiers and power requirements. This class is not what you expected. 
If you did not contact me before the semester started, I'm quite confident that this course will not be what you expected. College classes are not objective. There's a personal viewpoint to each course. This is not necessarily the instructor's viewpoint. For instance, in a class with a textbook, the viewpoint is probably that of the textbook's author. In a class on a particular artist or thinker, certainly it is that artist or thinker's viewpoint that drives the class, although certainly the instructor's views on the artist or thinker will also be important. In a studio art class such as this, you have my viewpoint as an artist and professional driving the class. Thus, what you are getting is my current, personal, individual take on the material as a stepping off point and inspiration for your own creative explorations. Thus, without contacting me before the semester, there's no way you could have known what to expect. This is compounded by the fact that the television, radio, and emerging media department is changing. And this course is one of those at the forefront of the change. The department's new emphasis on emerging media is causing a shift in the emphasis of many courses. And since emerging media is my field of specialty, the change is quite present in my courses in particular. Lynda.com and what you don't need to pay for anymore. With a Brooklyn Public Library account or a New York Public Library account, incredible free Lynda.com tutorials are available for all major professional tools via the library web portal. Not the Brooklyn College Library web portal, the Brooklyn Public Library or New York Public Library web portal. It has never been easier and totally free to learn Photoshop, Pro Tools, Illustrator, After Effects, Premiere, Audition, etc. There is no longer a reason for you to pay college tuition to learn these tools. This is a good thing in that it relieves college classes from needing to provide training in packaged software tools, which is neither an effective use of university class time nor student tuition dollars. The fact that these resources are available online at no cost means that college classes and particularly liberal arts-focused curricula, can spend more time on the liberal arts and creative aspects of their mission. So definitely, if you don't have a library card, get a library card, and just know that you have amazing professional instructors and hundreds of hours of tutorials on an incredibly wide range of tools and techniques that can be very useful to you professionally. Time commitment for the course, the general formula for university study is plan two hours of non-synchronous work for each credit hour. So since this class is a three credit, five contact hour course, you should expect to spend six hours per week on this class in addition to our synchronous meeting. Some weeks you might spend more, some weeks you might spend less. This is just a quick review of the liberal arts idea. Brooklyn College is a liberal arts institution. And television, radio, and emerging media is a department with a particularly purist approach to the liberal arts mission. In other words, it is distinctly not professional training. The goal of a liberal arts department is to, through a subject matter, train the mind in domains such as critical and analytical thinking, rapid, effective comprehension of novel ideas, developing a clear and convincing writing style, problem solving, creativity and expression, developing intuition, framing ideas in cultural, historical, ethical, epistemological, and theoretical contexts. There's nothing wrong, absolutely nothing wrong with professional or conservatory training. And these things are available within CUNY and even in certain departments at Brooklyn College. But it's important to recognize, if you have not yet, that you are not in such a program. The mission of this department is not to prepare you for a career in television, radio, or emerging media in the same way that the English department is not preparing you for a career in English, nor the history department for a career in history, etc. In TREM, we are studying television, radio, and emerging media as a means towards training the mind and perhaps the spirit. We, the faculty, are teaching to the liberal arts mission through the field that we work in and know best. This does not mean you can't go on to work in television, radio, or emerging media with a BA at TREM. By all means, do. It's a fascinating and rapidly changing field. But the specific preparation offered by a liberal arts approach is intentionally broader. We want you to approach your future field or career, whatever it may be, with a set of mental tools and agility that could have been honed studying anything at all. From this perspective, 
how you study is vastly more important than what you study. As a case in point, I majored in philosophy and religion as an undergraduate. Not once did I think I would be a professional philosopher or clergyman. I was drawn to philosophy and religion because, after trying several majors, I felt it placed the strongest emphasis on training the mind to understand and manipulate complex ideas, develop clear thinking and writing, and be exposed to the work of innovative thinkers whose ideas change the world. And I enjoyed it, and I found the professors stimulating. I went on from there to work in television. I took a quick poll of friends who got degrees from liberal arts departments, and while some definitely continued in the field of their major, most did not. And here's a quick table. Um, majored in business administration, ended up in commercial video production. Majored in music, ended up as a filmmaker and DP. Um, and you can look down the list. Uh, the, the fourth one down, uh, majored in religion, worked for the NYPD, and then became a television producer. That's Amanda, who produced Law and Order Special Victims Unit. And uh, she was a, she was a th theology, a master's degree in theology, actually. There's some interesting ones in there. Just take a look at the, take a look down that list. And, and I mention this not because it's a good thing or a bad thing, but simply to point out that a liberal arts education is very consciously and specifically not preparation for a specific career. I believe that it is essential that students be clearly aware of the kind of program in which they are participating. For instance, compare our BA program with Bronx Community College's film production training program, which provides specialized training for union jobs in film and television. That, as is clearly stated, is a professional training program designed to qualify you for a specific job. Such training is widely available and is often less expensive than a degree program, or free, as in the case of New York City's Made in New York training programs. So uh, here's the Brooklyn College policy on academic integrity, and this is standard text that uh, should be in all of your syllabi, and I encourage you to read that. But here's some class policies specific to this class that you should be aware of. So in this class, your work must be independent and demonstrate your individual understanding. While it is okay to ask a friend or a classmate for assistance in understanding something, you may not copy and paste or exactly copy any of their work and submit it as your own, nor have them do any work for you. Similarly, you may not copy and paste or exactly copy work from any other source. By the time you're done transforming any borrowed material into your own derivative work, it must substantially differ from the source. Even so, the source of any material you received from a classmate or any other source must be cited. If the work is online, you have to provide a functional link to the work. If the work is from a source that is not online, you must provide a copy of the work in addition to your derivative work. Failure to do so will be considered a breach of academic integrity, which will be reported as required by the college. Any breach of academic integrity, the one described here or any other, will result in a course grade of D-, minus, regardless of any other grading factors. And part B of this is that material provided by me as part of tutorials, quizzes, demonstrations, for instance, image or sound files that I provide, may not be used in your own creative work. It's each student's responsibility to find or create the media used in their projects, except as specifically stated. Here's the college's uh, statement from the Center for Student Disability Services, also standard in all syllabi. You should read that, as well as the student bereavement policy. So every course within a department fits into a structure of department objectives and partially fulfills those objectives through its own course objectives and anticipated outcomes. These sections refer to how this course fits into the structure of the department. I encourage you to read it and let me know if you have any questions about it. Let's move on to the method of evaluation. So 25% of the grade will be for the synchronous assignments. These are projects that you complete or attempt to complete during our synchronous meeting times. And these will include quizzes and what would have been called in-class projects, and also homework that's assigned during the synchronous meeting so you can get started on it while I'm available to help you. Developing speed and confidence in your work is an important part of the synchronous assignments. You need to achieve a certain comfort level and fluency with the tools that allows you to work quickly and fluidly so that you can get past the technical hurdles and move on to 
the creative part of the project. Any missed synchronous assignments must be made up. There's a policy in the class of completion of all assignments. We'll get to that in a moment. Also, attendance is taken through the submission of synchronous assignments. So even if you've not completed the work or you feel you've done poorly on it, be sure to submit it in its incomplete form so that I give you credit for attendance and then you can complete it and submit it later. Then 25% of the grade is for the one-week projects and the homework. So this is work that will be assigned with a due date and submitted on Blackboard and completed on your own time. So the class participation grade consists of remaining in regular contact with me throughout the semester about assignments, projects, course progress, creative dialogue, and any other topics, as well as regularly asking well-formed questions. Also, there may be other class participation assignments throughout the semester that will be part of this 25% of the grade. And then 25% of the grade are the major projects. These are major creative and technical endeavors using the concepts taught in the class. Uh, some aspects of these projects will be at your discretion. Other aspects will be assigned. And then this is the completion of all assignments policy, which is an important feature of this class. Because each thing we do builds on something we've done previously, and because work you do is later going to be folded into future assignments, you can't skip anything. Quizzes, homework, one-week projects, work in progress, submissions, questions, all assignments of any type must be completed. And failure to complete all assignments just takes 20% off of your grade. Late work will be penalized 10% if it's late, plus an additional 10% per week late. But no matter how late it is, all coursework must be submitted. There's also a couple of maximum lateness conditions. So if you have three or more assignments that are more than one week late, or any assignment more than three weeks late, you get an automatic D in the course. Now, of course, that should never actually happen because if you're in a situation where you have an assignment that's more than three weeks late or you have three assignments that more than one week late, you should drop the course. I mean, clearly you should drop the course. If you don't and you choose for some reason to stay in the course, your grade will be automatically set to a D. And regardless of what else you submit over the course of the semester, that D will not change. Now, if you submit work in an incomplete form, that's fine. You'll receive a grade of 0 0.1 on Blackboard. And if you submit the work by the deadline, incomplete work will automatically be given a 24-hour extension without penalty. So if you submit it by the deadline but it's not done and you finish it within 24 hours, that will still count as submitted on time. However, if you submit incomplete work and don't submit the completed version within 24 hours, then it will be considered late. There'll be a 10% penalty plus 10% per additional week late. So attendance of the synchronous meetings is required. Please plan to miss no synchronous meetings. Do not schedule any work, doctor's appointments, or appointments of any type during the synchronous meetings. They will not be excused. The first absence from a synchronous meeting will deduct 5% from the final course grade. Subsequent absences from synchronous meetings will each deduct an additional 10% from the course grade. Three absences will result in an unrecoverable grade of D in the course, regardless of any and all other grading factors, with uh, an exception in the case of a documented medical emergency. Due to the importance of attending the synchronous sessions, absences are not excused except in the case of a medical emergency or religious observance. Work and job interviews are not excused absences. To petition for a medical absence to be excused, submit official documentation of a medical emergency and a signed letter from a person who is not a family member explaining the situation with contact information. Absence due to religious observance is excused per New York State education law. Absence on the first day of class is automatically excused and is not included in the three absence limit. So we've already touched on academic integrity, plagiarism, and cheating. A breach of academic integrity, plagiarism, or cheating will result in a final grade of D- minus in the class, regardless of projects submitted, projects not submitted, or any other grading factors. Also included in the syllabus is a rubric, which clarifies uh, the categories of things that meet expectations, do not meet expectations, or exceed expectations. So if you want to know what the grading is based on, I suggest that you carefully look through this rubric. 
And at the end of the syllabus is the course schedule, which just shows the days on which we have synchronous meetings and uh, a rough description of what's going to be happening on that day. However, this is going to be modified based on the pace at which the class as a whole is progressing and updates will be posted to Blackboard. And that's the syllabus.